overcome. First, they are putting enormous pressure. Uh, and when you vote, then they will start questioning you. Why did you abstain? You were supposed to vote. Your abstention is a, it become a enabler. But then you ask, it. when the United Nations was formed, or the charter was uh, 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 drafted, uh, most of Africa, with the exception of the few, were not independent. But the voting patterns was established. Yes, no, abstention. And they all are, all, they are all equal. But now, why should you question me if I vote in the way I want to, to vote? So those are things that uh, in the new world order, there should be no lecture and student. We must all equal. So I thank you, and I might apologize for the lengthy explanation. It's possible. Thanks uh, a lot for your bright, flamboyant, uh, substantial explanation, and I fully agree that uh, the country that uh, does not succumb uh, to pressure could be sovereign, and uh, the reason that there are so many countries uh, have come to Russia to take part in the Russia-Africa summit, despite the pressure, is uh, indicative of the fact uh, that African countries stand uh, for true sovereignty. I would like to give floor. And now to Mr. Mogilevsky and uh, Konstantin, we have been talking about new tools of uh, colonialism, and I think that uh, one of the tools uh, is uh, colonialism in intellectual and educational sphere. Science and education systems in many countries are built uh, in such a way so as to meet the interests of uh, not the countries per se, but uh, of uh, the Western customers. Let me give you an example. When uh, the delegation of uh, Russian doctors uh, visited uh, Rwanda, the local doctors that uh, studied in uh, the EU and in uh, the US uh, have the right uh, to identify the dangerous uh, viruses uh, and uh, seal it into a tube and send it either to the EU or the US. They cannot study it themselves. So how can we overcome colonialism in this sphere? The reason is that uh, those uh, scientists, uh, scholars, receive grants and they receive money for what uh, not the local community community is interested in, but uh, what the West is interested in. How can we overcome colonialism in uh, the scientific and educational sphere? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, esteemed colleagues. I will compose my answer for in two parts. Well, first, we need to well understand the nature of this phenomenon, the nature of colonialism, its history, and the circumstances which resulted to its reappearance or renaissance, the renaissance of colonialism or what we call neocolonialism. Seemingly, the Second World War that defeated Nazism also as provided assessment of the colonial practices. They are very similar, the Nazi ideology and the ideology of colonialism. They separate all the people in two unequal parts. The people who have the rights for everything, including the right for life, health, and the results of labor of other people, and the rest who are the victims in this case. It is by no chance that the changes in the world order after the Second World War, including those in the African countries, 
made, gave reasons to think that the colonial practices are over. Well, and these uh, things and the renaissance of colonials must be studied by historians, political scientists, experts on, in other uh, social stu studies. This is uh, what is uh, we are studying at uh, the Academy of Sciences, and we're thankful to the Universal History Institute and other organizations that prepared very interesting and analytical material for this session. Of course, we will continue uh, this work in collaboration with our African friends, from, with scholars from Africa. And secondly, and the second thing is what you mentioned, it's a practical action intended to provide our African friends a normal alternative in the area of education so that the African youth can get high-quality education in sciences so that people, after they graduate, can participate in developing new knowledge and new technologies for the benefit of their countries. Look, there's two different approaches here, the Russian approach and the Western approach, which is being practiced by the neo-colonialist countries. The Western approach is as follows. One needs to find the most talented people in Africa to bring them to their own territory, luring them by personal prospects to provide them with good education and to make them stay in the West so that they work for the benefit of the metropolis. What does an African donor state get, get from that? Nothing. They just lose talent. The Russian approach is quite different. Ever from the Soviet time, we have been focusing on training talented people here, training them in different specialities and then stimulate them to come back to their own countries so that they can develop their own economies. What do we get out of it? We get friends. We get people who, by making their own career and by making success in Russia, would know what Russia is and who cannot deceive those people and no fakes about Russia will ever be acceptable for them because they have seen it with their own eyes. They are friends of Russia and we are their friends. Certainly, those who want to go into fundamental science should get this possibility, should be able to create new technologies and new scientific research on equal, on par with their partners. And in that sense, we welcome uh, African scholars in joint humanitarian projects and in big mega science projects. And it's symbolic that quite recently the South African Republic became a corresponding member of, of the Dubna Nuclear Research Institute and thus most state-of-the-art technologies became available for African scholars. I thank you for an opportunity to speak here. In conclusion, I would like to invite the forum participants to look at a very interesting exhibition which was set up under the auspices of the Ministry of Higher Education. Uh, it's an exhibition of photos 
which describe the support of anti-colonial struggle in Africa by the Soviet Union. It is close to the exit to the hall. Irina and esteemed participants, I have to apologize because we see a great interest uh, displayed by our colleagues from African countries, the ministries of education, minister of education, there's meeting after meeting, and it would be... It would be fitting for me to participate Спасибо in those большое, meetings. Uh, Thank you very much за ваше выступление, за то, как Россия способствует тому, for telling us how Russia facilitates uh, 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 the process of African uh, liberation from intellectual colonialism. Speaking about the new tools of colonialism, I would like to address our guest who was for a long time uh, the Minister of Economic Development, uh, uh, Mr. Sharif Singh. Mr. Singh, how serious is uh, the dollar as a financial instrument, and can one overcome uh, the financial oppression in uh, the financial sphere? Despite the fact that the share of dollar is reducing, it is still a leading uh, international currency, and whether that's justified, the matter is that most of the products in the world, the global product is not produced in the West, but rather in the East. And whether the share of uh, the dollar is real, because really the products are not produced in the United States, because the United States mostly produce virtual products. Can we create a more just financial system? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. I thank you for an opportunity to speak at this meeting. Five minutes ago, I did not know I would be speaking, but it is great pleasure for me to do that. I was a technical advisor and a chief economist to the president of the republic. I wasn't a minister, but first and foremost, I'm a researcher and a teacher. And I'm also very active in non-political organizations, uh, and first and foremost, I would like to draw a certain trajectory. Certainly, I will be using the words that are prohibited in the West, and that's capitalism and imperialism, but in my opinion, they are live as they have never been, and very well describe the, res the reality that they describe. First and foremost, I would like to say that uh, the path of uh, African history deviated in the 19th century. And when I say Africa, I mean African countries. So the tragic body of has uh, changed when the continent met Westerners. And as a result, Africa is the only region of the world which for four centuries was defined, whose future was defined outside the continent. And we understand that this cannot be tolerated any longer, and the world should not tolerate that either. One should remind that Burkina Faso has not always been a poor territory that everyone won't get. In 1550, 
l'Asie global balance et le continent africain. Was based les on Europe, plus Asia, plus and plus riche and the African le continent. Et les cartes du Europe moins riche, le plus faible, a bit more rich, faisait moins de deux. Africa was Ça n'atteignait pas encore un rich. à deux en termes de puissance, de capacité, de développement économique et social. Aujourd'hui, les estimations les plus optimistes considèrent que le rapport uh, est de 1 à 32. Now, Cela pour montrer à quel point le continent a été 32. marginalisé à ce point. C'est uh, important de le savoir. Shows how the Et c'est avec la mort d'un tel processus. Bien sûr, l'Afrique a ses responsabilités. Track. Nous n'avons pas que, que, que disons, euh, also bears de, responsibility for des valeurs, that. disons. L'Afrique aussi a beaucoup de défauts. We si elle n'était pas euh, organisée, désorganisée, à un point très avancé, ce qui est arrivé ne serait pas arrivé. Il faut que les Africains Certainly, assument Africa aussi leurs responsabilités lorsqu'il le faut. We also Donc, share la trajectoire responsibility a commencé à dévier on est arrivé so, la colonisation. La colonisation, c'est un moment de pillage de ressources au profit des grands pays industrialisés. Uh, et, et, et il faut en profiter pour expliquer que la colonisation signifiant l'administration directe et derrière nous, il n'y a pas de puissance coloniale qui administre directement un Now, territoire this is africain. Not the case. Là aussi, c'est no pour situer la responsabilité des Africains. C'est le néocolonialisme, uh, c'est-à-dire no une Afrique dominée et contrôlée African avec l'intermédiaire, l'entreprise so d'Afrique eux-mêmes soumis now, uh, uh, au nouveau maître du monde. C'est ça la réalité de, de, du continent. Euh, the control Donc, il y a eu la colonisation avec un pillage extrêmement world, important le nombre de morts qu'on n'arrive toujours so pas à chiffrer. Et est arrivée la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Avec la Seconde Guerre mondiale, il s'est passé quelque chose de très intéressant. Il y a eu un basculement comme nous sommes en train de le vivre aujourd'hui, et j'y reviendrai. C'est le moment où la Grande Puissance, la Grande Bretagne, était en train d'être surclassé par les États-Unis. Mais les États-Unis ont bien étudié pourquoi elles étaient en train de devenir la première States. puissance mondiale. But Déjà, United les deux States, tiers des réserves mondiales étaient dans les États-Unis. La bourse de New York power. a mis à terre la bourse de Londres. Because et surtout, les Américains ont découvert que leur puissance the nouvelle US était due au libre-échange qu'ils tenaient avec l'Europe. Une idée de la reconstruction de l'Europe avec le plan Marshall. Mais il y a eu une nouvelle conditionnalité que vous ne trouvez pas, And certainement pas dans les livres new conditions arose le 6 janvier 1946 au large de la Bretagne. Un protocole en avenant, appelez-le comme vous voulez, a été signé par les États-Unis et les Européens signed, uh, pour mobiliser les Européens Britain, à libérer uh, les colonies. Et c'est à ce, ce moment-là qu'il faut se demander pourquoi. Étant devenu une puissance première à cause du libre-échange, étant donné made, que l'espace du capitalisme freedom of trade, the United la States became the strongest power in the world. Non. L'impérialisme est consubstantiel au capitalisme. The matter Dès is that the epoch of imperialism closely related to capitalism are doomed uh, and uh, the United States Donc, decided that all the countries should be their territory, that they should subordinate the whole planet. Il they did fallait not just intégrer want dans le continue the les anciennes colonies. C'est comme ça que sont arrivées les, 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 les indépendances, les indépendances, free trade. Et, disons, et this et brought quand même them des to luttes, the idea of un peu partout, des mouvements pas nègres sur toute la planète, les Africains ont tout le temps résisté. Je rappelle ça, c'est important de le dire. Donc, on donne l'indépendance et, et on en profite avec un processus d'endettement forcé. À partir de 1973, avec les 30 glorieuses, la surliquidité financière et monétaire à l'échelle mondiale, il n'y avait que deux sources There possibles was a pour absorber les ressources financières et monétaires disponibles. C'était les anciennes colonies et les États-Unis. Les États-Unis ne voulaient pas de cet argent, mais ils avaient un secrétaire d'État très intelligent qui s'appelait Robert McNamara. 
had a very uh, clever Secretary of State, Robert McNamara, who said a simple thing. We see nations that need ports and airports, and we will ask them to take our money. And this resulted in decolonization. And then il fallait it became les tenir clear autrement. et l'ajustement structurel, ouvrir la porte aux nouveaux maîtres du monde, comme je les appelle, c'est-à-dire la Banque mondiale, le Fonds monétaire et les partenaires au développement. Ce processus mérite quand même d'être compris. Toutes ces stratégies, on peut les considérer comme des stratégies de dépossession des capacités autonomes des peuples anciennement dominés. C'est de cela qu'il s'agit. Aujourd'hui, il y a une nouvelle dynamique, une nouvelle dynamique qui suscite énormément d'espoir après l'échec relatif de la tricontinentale créée par les trois colonies, après les trois régions du monde, après la conférence de Bandung. Quel espoir peut-on fonder sur cette dynamique, par exemple, en termes de monétaire Moi, je dis très objectivement que euh, je crois qu'il se passe quelque chose, il faut l'assumer. Il faut I travailler hope, à faire cette dynamique dans tous les domaines parce que ce n'est plus soutenable que tout le commerce international se fasse uh, avec le dollar. Je ne peux pas le développer ici, mais c'était simplement des propos uh, introductifs. Et à ce moment-là, l'Afrique uh, qui peine, les pays en tout cas uh, anciennement colonisés par la France, qui peine avec le France CFA, ont intérêt à rejoindre ce pôle pour qu'émerge une nouvelle monnaie qui permette quand même de donner surtout des capacités à la, 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 comment dirais-je, au secteur privé africain. Parce que lorsque vous dépendez d'une monnaie, vous perdez très souvent, progressivement, la capacité de dégager des ressources suffisantes pour le développement du secteur privé. Et d'ailleurs, ça se traduit par la politique de gestion de l'inflation. Pour terminer, globalement, nous sommes dans une dynamique où il n'y a pas fondamentalement dans les anciennes colonies de politique économique à proprement parler, mais une politique de gestion par la contrainte budgétaire. Il faut que nous sortions cela. Cela doit se faire de cette façon-là. Rompre les relations traditionnelles avec les partenaires sans rompre avec tous les partenaires. On ne rompt pas avec les partenaires, mais on recherche, disons, sa déconnexion, le delinking. Nous avons besoin de déconnecter d'un certain type de relations que nous avons héritées du passé. Et on est heureux qu'aujourd'hui que les partenaires qui sont dans les BRICS le comprennent. Et je termine pour dire que la question monétaire est quand même très sérieuse. Et les États-Unis restent encore un pays très fort. Le dollar ne tombera pas après demain. Je vous remercie de votre attention. The U.S. is very strong, and the dollar will not fall tomorrow. Thank you for your great uh, performance, and uh, I would like to say that uh, to, there is a person to the left of uh, me who is the, in charge of one of the imp most important universities, and the graduates work everywhere in Africa as well. Uh, and, uh, it is uh, Anatoly Tarkunov from Gimo. Anatoly, what do you think? How uh, the international affairs will be developing in the new world order? Will that uh, be primarily bilateral, multilateral within the framework of the old and new alliances, EU, SCO, BRICS? Uh, AU, what will the what did, will the transformation of the international relations be? I'm uh, convinced uh, absolutely that the regional alliances, uh, the AU, will be developing at uh, high speed. Uh, and uh, related to the development uh, of the uh, unified uh, African currency. This issue has been under discussion for quite a long, but since uh, this uh, idea has been discussed uh, in BRICS, and uh, there are quite a few interesting ideas in BRICS uh, related to the 
common currency, and I think these discussions uh, will uh, be going in parallel, and uh, it is uh, in the interests uh, of uh, many countries, and I know that uh, there are many countries in Africa are interested in joining a session to BRICS, and uh, not only in Africa, but in Asia as well. So I believe in regional unions, alliances, and uh, it is a large union, and uh, there is uh, one uh, AEU, African Union, and uh, they have adopted a program, a large uh, strategic program, uh, till uh, 2050s and 60s, and I think uh, it is very important for Russia to study this uh, program. And uh, we, as a friendly partner, should uh, join hands in glove with African uh, countries uh, to start implementing this uh, program as well. Despite the bipolar system uh, has uh, crashed, uh, still. Uh, the great gamble was uh, set up uh, by our Western partners after the Second World War, and I would like uh, to remind you of George Cannell formula, and, uh, it is uh, we should tread carefully to weaken all uh, the uh, foes, and so it was not uh, treading carefully, but uh, it was straightforward as well. And uh, it is very interesting to note uh, how the Russian attitude to cha change, uh, let me quote, uh, two quotes, in the 90s, uh, Russia became uh, a uh, uh, spot of resistance uh, to the policies of the West, and, uh, of, of the U.S. Uh, primarily, and its uh, way could be described by uh, two quotes of the uh, presidents of the Russian Federation, Russia has uh, uh, extends the hand of friendship to the people of the U.S. And uh, in 2022, another quote, Russia will not be living by these rules. So that's the evolution of our approach. And uh, starting from the 60s of the 20th century, Russia was uh, against uh, colonialism, and uh, it uh, started developing the relations with Africa, and uh, I can tell you about uh, my university, and uh, uh, there was uh, a teaching of uh, three, uh, correction, four African African, uh, languages, and uh, there were many students from Africa, many of them still uh, work uh, in Africa, and so a lot of efforts uh, were taken to train specialists uh, for Africa, and I was surprised to know that uh, some of the regional higher educational establishments uh, did that, and uh, I take, uh, for, for example, Volgograd uh, Medical uh, Institute, and uh, they trained uh, African uh, students to become doctors. And uh, right now, we do not uh, have the long-term uh, program, which uh, could be part uh, of the African Union. I mean, we do not have the concept of the long-term policies in Africa. And I think uh, the experts, the specialists, uh, should uh, discuss it. Uh, we have a different uh, brainstorming organization and scientific uh, study centers uh, present over here, because we have to understand that uh, Africa is a competitive, has a competitive environment. And uh, it's not only the countries of the West that Mr. C has been talking about. There are other countries uh, which are not unfriendly. Uh, take China in, or India, which are very prominent in uh, Africa. So when we make plans in Africa, we should uh, uh, act under the assumption that it's uh, the, the richest uh, continent. They have a uh, high level of intellectual elite living and working there. And of course, it always will remain uh, the arena of competition for external forces. That's uh, the assumption we should act uh, upon. And, uh, 
we should uh, interact with the youths. We had two forums, Russia, Africa. Like, uh, what, uh, what's, the what's the future? It's about the, the youth forum, and uh, dozens of uh, young Africans uh, came. And so that kind of interactions, uh, summer camps, uh, should uh, be regular. I'm not talking about education. Education, it goes without saying, but uh, mass uh, activities is uh, we for African youths uh, to come to know their uh, Russian counterparts. It uh, could be organized not only in Russia but in Africa as well, and uh, it will make us uh, closer emotionally as well because the future belongs uh, to the youngsters, and uh, they uh, will uh, take the reins into their hands both in the economy, in pol politics, and in the finances. Thank you, Anatoly. I cannot but agree with you with uh, all the things that you have mentioned. I would like uh, to introduce uh, an important uh, panelist uh, taking part in our session. It is Mr. Leonid Slutsky. Leonid Slutsky is a leader of the Liberal Democratic Party of uh, Russia and the head of uh, the faction of uh, LDPR in State Duma, and uh, he is uh, the head of the International Affairs uh, Committee of the Russian Parliament. And this is a provocative question that I have for you. I have known you for quite some time. I think I'm entitled to ask the question. Your party is liberal democratic, both liberal and democratic. And so the notion of uh, liberalism and the democracy in the modern world have they changed any? I'm under the impression that uh, we cannot talk uh, neither about uh, real liberalism or democracy. And, uh, could it be uh, possible that these uh, two notions uh, would uh, have different definitions in the new world order? Thank you for non-stored on the standard uh, question, dear colleagues. Friends, uh, participants of the discussion. First of all, I would like to thank uh, our charming mediator, uh, the member of the Academy of Science, Ms. Irina Abramova, who is, uh, has been in charge of the Institute of Africa of the Russian Academy of uh, Science. For many years, we have been navigating the Institute uh, along the path that was difficult uh, and fortuitous, and uh, it is uh, your time now for Russia is developing a new concept of uh, foreign policy, and uh, Russia is uh, seeking new partners in the international relations, and Africa is uh, playing a new role. And, uh, you have been moderating the uh, panel with the uh, President of Russia present and uh, the heads of the state and governments of uh, some African countries uh, present, and uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your labor and your a champion of uh, the cooperation with uh, Africa, and I would like to thank, uh, let's give a, a round of applause uh, to our mediator, and uh, you know, the physicist uh, Albert uh, Einstein has uh, saying that if matter is uh, removed uh, from the universe, the universe, both time and space will be gone. The situation is developing in such a way that uh, unfortunately the international war is uh, vanishing from uh, the universe and uh, it has been developed for 100 years and many scholars have contributed to its development. Both the international schools in the West and in Russia and uh, right now the, the attempts of uh, one uh, country to build uh, the world order with one pillar of influence and power is a twisted world order. It is a destructive construct. Every nation, every country, and, uh, 
Any continent, uh, however big or small, it should be with the unique uh, languages. It should be a single, uh, a pool of uh, force. And uh, that kind of world architecture has a different notion, definition of uh, democracy. Let's see what uh, the U.S. is. They've been teaching us that it's the cradle of democracy and uh, the major export of democracy to different uh, countries of the world. Do they have democracy in the U.S.? Take the situation with the latest uh, presidential elections in the U.S. It has uh, demonstrated only too well. Well, uh, what, but it's not there. Uh, we do not uh, need export of that kind of democracy to our countries. The understanding of democracy as uh, the power of uh, people and uh, as uh, the free will of people expressing their will in, uh, when taking part in the political processes. And uh, right now, any country who stands uh, for multipolar world understands democracy in the same manner, and uh, in this uh, system of coordinates of the multipolar world, the understanding of democracy is uh, just uh, common. It does not uh, coincide with uh, the democracy they have in the West, in the collective West. They have a different uh, division of countries for you and uh, old uh, democracies uh, for lecturers and pupils. Uh, and uh, this uh, does not stand. As far as uh, liberalism is uh, concerned, our countries uh, have parties who consider themselves, themselves uh, liberal, and uh, we have a party which is uh, referred to as liberal, and it's a ruling party in Japan. Now, the understanding uh, definition of liberalism is uh, defined by the attitude towards uh, people and the uh, multipolar world, which is uh, the, the only benchmark for the development of uh, the world uh, civilization in the 21st century. So the multipolar world and uh, uh, aspiration of, uh, to make that uh, world uh, uh, is uh, embodied in uh, liberalism, and uh, I understand that uh, many in this world uh, tend to agree with me as far as uh, relations of Russia with the African countries is concerned. It is one of the factors of developing international relations. The infrastructural projects, the political projects, the economic projects, the cultural and humanitarian, humanitarian projects are indeed of strategic nature for us. We have common problems for private banking, mining, joint ventures, rehabilitation of national economies of different countries. Africa, and the number of that kind of uh, project, as uh, you being a professional of African года, studies, I mean, is growing with uh, every passing year or month. That boasting, because uh, there is a lot of work uh, to do, I would like uh, to note uh, that uh, we have uh, people spiritually closed uh, to us. We had a parliament Forum, Russia, Africa, with uh, President uh, Putin, uh, President, and it was a precursor of today's uh, summit that brought us all together in St. Petersburg. There is a great number of uh, agreements and uh, projects, new programs signed uh, here, and uh, we have a unique uh, understanding at the level of uh, heads of states, and uh, then uh, bringing it down to the level of experts. Experts uh, is uh, an indication uh, that uh, uh, one of the key vectors of the development of uh, foreign policy of uh, Russia has the African vector has been uh, selected by President uh, 
дискуссию, сумеем э, понять, think, uh, что неоколониализм и э, другие уродливые явления, которые сегодня уже уходят в историю, как бы Запад не пытался проводить новую колониальную политику, в том числе и политику откровенного нацизма, которая сейчас наполняет марионеточный режим в Украине, все это должно уйти в историю. 21-го столетия должно стать столетием, когда любые формы колониализма, колониальной политики, деление стран на новые старые демократии, учителей и учеников должны уйти в историю. Сегодня африканские страны накопили огромный объем своей собственной самобытности, своих собственных национальных проектов, которые нуждаются, безусловно, в поддержке стороны России, and, uh, и ближайшие uh, годы станут uh, годами of, uh, развития uh, этих совместных the... проектов. Во всех сферах нашей жизни уверен, что и парламентская дипломатия, в которой трудимся долгие годы, вице-спикер Совета Федерации, здесь присутствующий Константин Косачев, я, мои коллеги, присутствующие в зале, уверен, что эти усилия дадут свои плоды. И что касается гегемонистской политики Соединенных Штатов и всех целей, которые связаны с однополярным миром, Однополярным мироустройством 21-21 столетий уйдут невозвратно в историю вместе с колониальными тенденциями, которые чужды современной цивилизации, одинаковой степени чужды России и странам Африки. Впереди у нас прекрасные годы развития взаимодействия, ну, а что касается либерализма и демократии, дорогая Ирина Олеговна, дорогие коллеги, Уверен, что мы определим их в новой системе координат мировой цивилизации 21-го столетия более или менее одинаково. Большое еще раз спасибо. спасибо. Большое спасибо, Леонид Эдуардович. Действительно, в мире все меняется, меняются понятия, наполняются новым содержанием, наполняется новым содержанием и наша политика на африканском континенте, и в том числе наша панельная дискуссия. Единственная у меня большая просьба к следующим докладчикам соблюдать регламент. Нам осталось работать примерно 15-20 минут, и я хочу предоставить слово Маурису. Маурис Акули представляет здесь крупнейшую африканскую страну Нигерию и одновременно является профессором Северо-Восточного федерального университета имени Амосова. Это очень интересное сочетание, о чем говорил недавно академик Таркунов, что очень много специалистов, которые сейчас работают и живут в Африке, были подготовлены в том числе в российских вузах. Уважаемый Маурис, у меня к вам такой вопрос. Нигерия – страна, которая обладает колоссальными нефтяными и газовыми ресурсами, и Россия такая же страна. Запад нещадно эксплуатирует эти ресурсы, по сути дела, превратив Россию, после того, как распался Советский Союз, крупнейшего экспортера именно этого вида ресурсов назад. Такую же роль в определенной степени играет и Нигерия. Вот как, по вашему мнению, в новом миропорядке будет выстраиваться и будет меняться роль государств, обладающих крупными сырьевыми ресурсами? Будут ли у них возможности использовать эти ресурсы не просто для перекачки, предположим, на Запад в другие страны и для обогащения собственных элит, а будет ли возможно использование этих ресурсов в интересах всего населения стран? Спасибо. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, permit me to stand on the existing protocol. I want to set the premise of this, this discussion by saying it loud and clear that Russian people are pleasant people. Russian people are people of humanity. Russian people believe in helping the weak, helping the strong. I, 
and the culture and value of Russian people is humanitarian assistance. Russians believe in oneness of all human beings, and they believe in fairness and justice. Having said this, I want to let you know that Russians have played a vital role in the world today and are still playing. What I'm going to say here before I get to um, the role of uh, oil and gas, whether Africa, particularly Nigeria, will be able to use that for the, for the people of the country. But let me delve a little bit into multipolar world. You know, today, we are facing a problem in the world. And that problem of humanity, or problem of uh, people of the world, is an attempt to resist reality. You know, sometimes people build decision, take action, based on wishful thinking. But that brings the world into a great turmoil and problem. Looking at the situation today, the reality is that the world is moving towards a multipolar world. Attempt to resist that movement of the world towards multipolar world will bring the world into crisis and into turmoil. Let's remember that uh, this multipolar world we are talking about today, that uh, BRICS is at the vanguard of this multipolar world. And if we could remember vividly, it was on this St. Petersburg in 2005 that the uh, president of Russia invited um, India and China and uh, it was formed. That time it was formed, it was called RICS. That is Russia, India, and China. Later joined uh, South Africa and Brazil. That turns to BRICS. Today that BRICS has a, ge a geographical coverage of 25% of the world uh, geographical area. And it is a home to about uh, 2.8 billion people. And that covers around 46% of uh, um, the world um, population. So why do I say it in connection with uh, what uh, Prof. Serena said about uh, the resources? It is no secret that today there is a second scramble for Africa. And that scramble for Africa is about resources and nothing more. Uh, if you look around the African continent, countries where you have resources, there is always conflict there. It's not by accident. It's because of an attempt to exploit that resources without allowing the people who are inhabited in, in that place to benefit. It brings about conflict. So the question whether, for example, Nigeria will be able to use the resources for the people of Nigeria. Well, uh, it's a big question. That brings us about to the attempt of uh, not, to, not, not only political independence, but economic independence. Because the reality is that in this world we are living today, there are a few people who decide what happens in it. And these few people are called global decision makers. You know, and uh, it is unbelievable the insanity this group of people are willing to exhibit in order to protect their interests. So you should know what happened in the process, in the process of protecting an interest. It's always a conflict and a trouble. I know my time is up, but let me round up by saying that, uh, yeah, you know, not only that uh, because of uh, new colonialism, Africa will be able to find it difficult to exploit their resources. Because most of the, those resources actually are being exploited by European companies or Russian companies. I don't think you have seen in Africa 
an African company is exploiting resources in, in any of European country. I don't think I've seen it. Or an African company exploiting resources in uh, Western Europe. But what you see is on the reverse. It's either Western or European country exploiting resources in Africa. And I don't think also you have seen where there is an African base in Europe and America. It's the other way around. It's an American and European base, military base, little over Africa. So in that kind of stringent condition, how do you think Africa will succeed? We are at the mercy of the power that be. We just, I don't know, <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, let me end here by saying that um, um, in all acts of human beings, there is always act of God. We hope that uh, as time goes on, African will find a way out of it. Looking at this even geopolitical tension, it just reminding Africa what happened when there was a uh, Soviet bloc, I mean Warsaw Pact and NATO. The, two strong, the struggle for this superpower, Africa suffered more than any other continent. And that led some of African countries to form an association called Non-Aligned Movement. Movement. Today is the same thing. We are here, you know, uh, having these uh, breaks. So many people would have been here, but you know, they also you know, have to watch whether to attend or not to attend. Uh, depends on certain circumstances. So that is the reality of our time. And there's nothing we can do. We have to go with it, wishing that uh, it will get better in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Okole. Now I would like to pass the floor to Mikhail Lipkin, the Institute uh, of Mikhail Arkadyevich, of Russian Academy of Sciences. Mikhail, everyone knows that uh, the Soviet Union made a great contribution into the collapse of the colonial system, including that in Africa, what of the Soviet experience can be used to undermine the legacy of colonialism? Well, thank you very much. First of all, I would like to mention the magazine that we publish. Uh, it's uh, here uh, at the entrance uh, of the room, and can take it. Well, historians try to understand the major projects, and this provides the theoretical and practical uh, analysis of what uh, colonialism is based on the history of Africa and the context and the Soviet heritage, and you will learn about the Russian delegation participation in the African Studies scholars in 1961, and the numbers that show the, it shows that the Islamic movement is a response uh, to the colonialism in Africa and the history of Belgium and France. French colonialism, but I will tell you about what I and my young colleagues are doing. This is not only a problem of the new global order, which arose back in the 70s and the 80s, and those are very interesting things, because then, Maybe we made a, a wrong solution. Maybe the situation was different. There were three alternatives then to the previous speaker who identified them. The first was a capitalist world, which then transgressed into the neoliberal idea. Then there was a socialist alternative, which was very much blocked by the agenda of the new economic order, which was brought about by the non-alignment movement, where the Soviet Union collapsed, the Yugoslavia was destroyed, and we remain the unipolar system, 
which resulted into those tectonic shifts and the crises that we observed. We are actually coming back to the discussion of the 80s, what to choose. And when we look at the documents, we see that there was a huge number of ideas brought about by all the socialist countries, Poland, Hungary, GDR and Romania, about how to do that based on the development of a concept of international economic security, global security and these were very pragmatic things. every social and economic system there must be their own scale of values and this uh, relates to the uh, globalization versus what is much discussed. And the Soviet Union supported the regional pool of countries' development, which that the countries should provide for themselves through their own means in Africa and Latin America and everywhere. And that was the natural pool. They should not be governed from one center. So there's a lot of interesting material, and if you want to understand the future, of course the process is going on, we cannot ask historians predict anything, but if you look back, you should rethink the lost opportunities back in the 80s. Mikhail Arkadyevich, I agree with you, I remember the quote of Jeanne Jarrett, I would like uh, to recall the quote of uh, Jaurès, we take not only ashes but uh, flame from the history. And uh, the last but uh, not the least, uh, we have uh, the speaker, we have actually two who, have, uh, who, who can embody this subject вот Леонид Эдуардович говорил очень много теплых слов в мой адрес, мне это очень приятно, но на самом деле в большей степени эти слова относятся к Алексею Михайловичу, который руководил нашим институтом с 1991 по 2015 год, который был представителем в восьмерке, когда еще Россия входила в восьмерку, по Африке, который объездил практически, но я не знаю, сколько африканских стран, и имеет колоссальный uh, he traveled uh, immensely in Africa and his uh, vast uh, experience and uh, he is a specialist of the Arabic uh, studies and his books are published in Saudi Arabia, his books are translated in China, France, UK, everywhere. And I think uh, his uh, ideas on what the world order would be and what role will be played by Africa in this uh, world для Африки освободиться от наследия колониализма будут интересны всей нашей аудитории. Спасибо. Благодарю вас. Учитывая, у нас мало времени, я буду говорить Press for time, I would just give you the bullet points of some things. And I could agree with some of the definitions that were pronounced over here, but I could debate the others. I would like to share my ideas, some of them, some of the subject matters were not mentioned. The point is that we live in the period of turbulence and the world is changing rapidly, assuming new features, and there is one explanation for that, and it was omitted at today's discussion. The point is that the West became West, and the dominant system after the Industrial Revolution of 1890. And uh, before that, a quarter of the GNP was produced uh, by China, and uh, a little bit less uh, by India, and the colonialism of that time pushed back both China and India. India. But uh, since the end of the uh, 20th century and up to now, we have a manifestation of a new situation in the world. And, uh, it is essentially that non-Western world is developing faster than the 
Western world. Categorically, he wants to fact is negated by the leader of the West, the U.S. The, что мир надо демократизировать it, and, uh, по американским стандартам. Uh, и, естественно, за этой демократизацией uh, должен следить uh, the US, который все and, uh, знает именно Соединенные Штаты. Is, uh, а тот, кто не хочет следовать этому, того надо заставлять включать силы. Но США пытались заставить Афганистан, Ирак, to do that. And the U.S. Uh, tried uh, to force Afghanistan and uh, Russia as well, but uh, it turned out that non-Western world and uh, China, first of all, has been developing uh, at such a fast rate that uh, there is uh, the same superpower equal to uh, the U.S. And uh, maybe be behind in some areas uh, but uh, being on the same period. footing with the U.S. Uh, in Китай, many areas. In 10 years, India, China will be number one, India США, will be number two, the U.S. will, will be and number three, and Indonesia, and Indonesia will be number four, and number five will be either Brazil or Turkey or some of the African nations. That's how the world is changing. The, the resistance to these changes results in the crisis, sometimes bloody crisis. As far as Africa is concerned, I do not want to resort to the highest authorities. Uh, because the, 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 there are some facts that have been uh, prepared by us and uh, reported uh, above. And uh, Putin, as a result, said that despite all the crises of the growth of the economy of Africa, they have uh, 4 or 5 percent of uh, growth rate despite the crisis. And, uh, different uh, negative things is developing faster than the rest of the world. The only thing is uh, that uh, the baseline is uh, low, but China started low as well, and India started low as well. That's why Africa has got the future, and uh, it has future both uh, economically and uh, intellectually. And, uh, let me give you a small fact. Uh, some 60 years ago, Large major Congo became independent. There were eight people with Lower higher education for 30 million. Lumumba, Mr. Lumumba was uh, one of them. And you know how he, he finished. And uh, it was uh, as a result uh, of the secret services from the West and uh, the, his opponent. Lumumba was uh, killed, and uh, large uh, right now, Congo is uh, not in a good situation. They have ethnic problems, uh, poverty, corruption, but uh, despite that, even this country is uh, producing dozens, thousands of uh, people with higher education, just like many other countries in Africa. It's only a small example, it means that uh, Africa has got the future, and uh, uh, the democratic dividends uh, will be paid in Africa. And uh, the Nigeria itself, uh, the population is uh, 214 million, and uh, it is uh, the France, Germany, Italy, and the UK all together. And if the situation is like that, Nigeria in some 20, 30 years will be equal to the whole of uh, Europe. That's the weight of Africa in the world, and since the the population of the world will be going down, unfortunately, demographic uh, problems in uh, Russia as well. But uh, in 30 or 40 years, the growth of the population will be only in uh, Africa, and uh, every third or fourth person in Africa in the world will be from Africa. 
That's uh, the force of the new phenomenon in Africa. Yes, Africa is not developing as fast as uh, China does. Uh, uh, that will happen to them in the future. But uh, based uh, on uh, our interest in uh, Africa and uh, Africa's interest in uh, Russia, we can uh, arrange uh, mutually beneficial uh, cooperation uh, in the economies and the security, and uh, we are building nuclear, we can build the nuclear power plant, uh, plant uh, or cooperation in outer space, healthcare. We have the experience of uh, cooperation with Africa. Unfortunately, our experience is prompting us that, uh, well, yes, uh, I'm uh, wrapping up. We, uh, at a certain time, uh, found ourselves in the same shoes. Uh, in, in the 90s, uh, the economy collapsed uh, similarly to the period of the Second World War. And uh, then we have almost uh, left Africa for good. We are coming back. And uh, when we have been discussing, we have been telling them, look, uh, that's uh, what the situation is. Uh, we are the mineral resources uh, appendix uh, of Africa. And what did the Nigerians tell us? They told us, welcome aboard. And uh, it was uh, uh, our common position. And uh, we were victimized. Uh, and uh, it was our own fault. Uh, and we paid for it. Uh, Africa paid uh, with one trillion dollars uh, for the near colonialism and uh, we at the moment have common goals with Africa, we have common resources and uh, of course it would uh, contribute uh, to open cooperation of uh, Russia and Africa for common benefits. I could uh, talk at length but I think it's time to wrap up. Thank you, Alexei, for your great завершения нашей сегодняшней сессии я хочу предоставить слово нашему большому другу президенту Союза африканских диаспор Кинфу Зенебе Тафеси. Пожалуйста. Thank you, Professor Irina. I will be brief and concise. First subject, the first subject is very dangerous, I think. Is, uh, quite hazardous. Uh, Russia once again is assuming the humanitarian missions. Uh, it is not to save Africa, but to save uh, Europe. And this, uh, subject matter that uh, Russia is uh, talking about, uh, but uh, this uh, is uh, plain, um, a dangerous uh, game. That's why it is uh, necessary to stop. And, uh, I've been talking about the Europeans, and this uh, mission is... Uh, showing that uh, in a few years, uh, it will be necessary to stop. We should uh, inform uh, the Africans what the legacy is. And it is uh, necessary to show what's the legacy. And, uh, and, uh, it, uh, the conflicts are inevitable, uh, and, uh, but the Russia has started a new mission because of the new mission. Thank you. I would like uh, to thank all the panelists and uh, summing up, I would like to say that uh, we have all together come to the conclusion that the, the new principle of the new world order will be sovereignty, sovereignty in economy, Culture, intellectual, sovereignty, and each nation should decide on its own, its own how it will be developing and who it will be making friends with. And uh, the new uh, world order depends uh, on uh, each and every one of us, and uh, including the youngsters uh, who are present in uh, this uh, audience, in this conference room. Thank you. Thanks a lot.